Hi, Zaim. Hi there. Good to see you, uh, even if it's, uh, you know, just like virtually. Yeah, I know. Uh, getting, getting used to it uh, now, nowadays after yeah. COVID. St still not there yet. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk to you because we've actually spent, uh, was it five days together about a week ago, like 10 days ago, um, as part of the a retreat, you know, um, like strategy, you know, uh, strategic planning for a, a charity we, we both are involved in, the PIPD, Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy. And, um, and you told me about your work and you told me um, particularly about the uh, Institute for Social and Economic Progress, uh, which is an independent institute um, that actually works and, and, and you know, and, and base its, like, um, you know, analysis on research and surveys in, you know, in regards to what the Palestinians want, what they don't want. And, um, and I thought this was fascinating because we are hearing many stories about the Palestinians, you know, in terms of, you know, their religion, in terms of uh, their political sort of, uh, you know, th you know idea, uh, like political, um, yeah, ideas in terms of the solution for Palestine. Is it a one state, a two state, a binational state uh, in terms of armed resistance or not, in terms of do they support Hamas or not? And you actually working on this a lot and you are producing some incredible content um, and I will obviously put all the links in the description below. So um, you've sent me something called Street Pulse. I mean, the name speaks for yeah. itself. Uh, it was conducted after October 7th. Actually, this one was conducted um, between December 13th and December 20th. So it's quite recent and around two months. And there's one before that. There's one before yeah. that, which is late, okay. later in October. So there's two. So, um, two. I wanted to, in a way, I wanted to start by asking you, uh, we've heard a lot in the media that after October 7th, the support for Hamas in, in, inside, in, you know, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem was had risen by like, you know, a third or something. Um, what, what would you say in particular about this question? You know, what did you find out when you spoke? Oh, maybe, sorry, maybe before you start, you can explain how do you do the surveys? Because it's very important to understand sure. you know, the questions and stuff. So yeah, go. You've got the floor. So, so, so I think, uh, thank you for hosting me, first of all. Um, and this is something I'm really excited about. So I really uh, will enjoy talking about it. So to start with, I'm actually from the business world. So, you know, previous life, I worked as an economist with nonprofits and, and development, and then I, I went into investment. And today, I, you know, a few years back, I co-founded a venture builder, which is basically some sort of investment vehicle to invest in startups in Palestine. One of our leading startups is called Mina Analytics, which is a data collection and management company. So the way I got into this is by, is actually looking at consumer data. So nothing to do with the politics, nothing to do with the uh, social stuff, nothing. However, you know, as this developed, um, you know, obviously we're thinking about a lot of the applications that this new tools, data, all of that will affect our lives. And I think this is something very relevant because, you know, this change that we're feeling it here in Palestine, but others are feeling it all over the world. So a lot of us, you know, working in this field came together and realized that actually we can also use this for political, social good. Uh, as well as obviously commercial and business uh, use cases. So this is the idea behind the, uh, the Institute that, you know, we had used not only surveys, by the way. so there are different models. So there's like many different ways to do research uh, um, on anything, but we, we just thought that these tools could be very applicable to understanding our society beyond consumption uh, and beyond investment, beyond business. Um, and this is where the ideas came from. Uh, we also realized something that our knowledge about ourselves is often generated by someone else. So even when we're uh, thinking about ourselves, we're speaking in terms that we didn't create. We didn't ask, you know, you know, I, I think of myself as progressive, for example. But then when I go and see what that means, if you go to the U.S., that means liberal, which is a very different thing than what a Palestinian progressive is, right? So. Here we realize that actually 
having a research institute is also not only a good way to use the tools we have and what we do best to do good, but also more essentially is to speak about us with our words. Uh, so this is where it com comes from. Of course, you know, we started all of this before the war on Gaza and so on. And the war happens and we realize that we need to do something. And obviously we didn't pull in Gaza because it, first of all, it's, we think it's unethical to ask people, you know, about all various political things when their life is literally being destroyed in front of their eyes. So we, we just didn't want to do that. But also, obviously, there are technical and operational challenges, to say the least. This is the nice way to say it, uh, to, to do this in Gaza. But we, but we still thought it's very important to understand what people in the West Bank think. Um, and particularly because West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem and Palestinians, citizens of Israel in 48, and diaspora and refugees in Jordan and Lebanon, these are all different parts of a Palestinian population. And the West Bank is of particular interest because it's actually under Israeli control and it's one of the places or the few remaining levers of pushback against Israeli apartheid. So it's actually of fundamental importance to understand what people in the West Bank think. And also, another thing is that I've been hearing a lot around me and even on the TV, but also in, 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 in just in the streets. I've been hearing a lot of frustration with the kind of response that happens in the West Bank. So why are people not taking up more, uh, more of, a, of a pushback? Why, why are people not going to protest? Why are you... So for me and for a lot of the people in, in this institute, um, we were thinking, but why is that? Uh, did people give up? Did pe are people afraid? So you, know, you have definitely two teams, right? So you have people who think, PA, Israel, all of these factors create a sense of fear where people are afraid to do anything and then they'll get arrested and all that. And there's definitely evidence to prove that. And that's a valid thing. But whether it's actually the main reason why people don't do stuff is actually an interesting debate. And on the other side, there are people who think that actually this is not exactly what people believe in and that actually this doesn't drive people enough uh, to, to do stuff. And that's also a valid Point of view, and I think a lot of people and a lot of people in the team could actually really show the data to support that. So these are two different articulations, and there are many. So we need to understand that, right? So given this whole thing, we looked at different theoretical frameworks to understand the current situation. And one of the frameworks we applied in the first poll, the street poll, is the hope framework. We basically said anything that happens in the Palestinian, any political act that happens in the Palestinian area. You know, whether you agree with it or you don't, whether it's, you know, legitimate, whatever it is, we need to place it within the hope paradigm in order to understand, is this something that will encourage more Palestinians to do further action and to liberate themselves and to achieve liberation eventually? Or would this something that be setting us back? So the hope framework gave us that, you know, it gave us a way to start understanding Okay, did this give people more hope? And if so, what kind of hope? And and if so, uh, you know, depending on what kind of hope, how can we build on? Um, so in a nutshell, I'm just gonna say, I'm you know, I'm gonna say the the general finding, and I'm gonna stop, and then uh, to allow you <laughs> to ask me other questions. But basically, in a nutshell, we found that while this attack gave a lot of Palestinians some sort of sense of equality with Israel, because in the, this is the first time Palestinians attack Israel. Like, this doesn't happen, you know, at, at this level, at this scale, on Israeli territory, you know. This, at this scale, has never happened before. So a lot of people, understandably, that made them feel like they're more powerful, <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, and because they, it made them feel more powerful, it made them feel more hopeful. Um, definitely, there's a segment of society especially those who are supportive of Hamas, supportive, and they exist, by the way. We shouldn't deny that this actually is a group of Palestinians. The, these people actually believe, you know, beyond that. You know, this is to them, this is part of, like, their story. Their, you know, Islamist Palestinian story that, you know, has you can look it up and learn more about it. But for most of society, this simply just gave them hope because they saw their oppressor, Israel, getting a slap in the face. 
for the first time in a very strong way. And that gave them hope. Now, when we look at expectation to understand, okay, does this hope make people expect a better future? Here is where actually the nuance becomes a bit complicated. So on the one hand, people think that they're closer to, lib to, to end of occupation. And I don't want to term that as liberation because that's one aspect of liberation, but there's many. So a lot of people think that they're closer to the end of occupation. But when you look at what people think the situation is going to be in terms of like risks and fears that they're afraid of, violence, uh, economic distress, etc., people expect the worst. So basically, it's not something that people think will really give them change today. You know, they don't um, think that. They just think it's more symbolically a victory. So I think that's important to understand when we talk about the effect of this on the Palestinian psychology. We tested also people's emotions. And the main emotion, I would say, is helplessness. And it's, not, it's, it's actually from the Arabic trend, the translation from Arabic is more like, sorry, inability, which means the inability to, do, to act, right? So a lot of people feel very anxious and very responsible to do something, but they don't see what it is. And actually, one of the most frustrating things for me so when we ask people, what can you do? A third of people said nothing. And another third of people said financial aid, which actually is indicative of, in my opinion, a, a humanitarian framing of, of a lot of these things. So, you know, because there's no mobilizing factor, political mobilization factor that actually frames what happens in a narrative that is political, ideological, gearing people for liberation, what ends up happening instead is a humanitarian framing, where, whereby I, I look at people, kids in Gaza who are Palestinian as well, I look at them the same way I look at, you know, uh, you know, any kind of ad trying to support famine somewhere. So although obviously I should care about all these things, this is not a famine, you know, this is a political premeditated oppression of people collectively. It's a collective punishment of a population. So unfortunately, I think that the, the humanitarian framing clearly, clearly won there. Now, on the second poll, we looked at also what people want in transition. So what they want after, what, what they're looking for. And to my surprise, the increase, the support for a two-state solution, for all solutions, really, increased. And what that really means is that when people feel more powerful, they're more willing to actually sit down on the table and try to negotiate. So the position of rejection, right, of I reject to negotiate, is actually created by people's sense of futility, by people's sense that, you know, these guys, there's nothing to talk about with them. But when you're strong, it changes. You become more able and more willing to negotiate because you have more cards to put on the table. So I think that's a big part of it. But it was very clear that people don't want just the transition, they want a democratic transition where they say what they want. So when we ask people, do you want anyone, who do you want to govern Gaza in the transition? And there have been many proposals. People, I mean, a slim majority supports Hamas staying in power until election time. So they're saying, if there's no elections, I don't want the political system to change actually. So I don't want, you know, uh, some international forces or some PA coming on top of an Israeli tank or any of that crazy American solutions. Instead, we'll keep the status quo until we actually vote. And people have rejected all types of transition and they've opted for vote now. Um, and also was interesting to see that like support for Hamas leaders, um, you could say, for example, that support for Sinwal is high, it wasn't the highest person. I mean, the highest supported person is Marwan Barghouti, who's actually Fatih. Um, and he's the only popular guy in Fatih, pretty much. And the reason why that is, is because he's a symbol of the resistance. And even within the Hamas leadership, support for Sinwar is much higher than support for Haniyeh. And this is because at least they are seen as one as grassroots politician and the other one is an established politician. So clearly people are more for grassroots for, for resisting <laughs> rather than the, the you know, administering the occupation. So that's for sure. 
support for independents such as Mustafa Baloudi, who's been doing a great job talking on TV, you know, internationally and so on. Obviously, support for him has increased, mostly, though, within secular parts of the Palestinian population, but still significant support. Um, but I wouldn't, another interpretation of support to Sinwar, which is around just over 50%, like maybe 55, I don't remember exact number, is that actually it's low. Because in conflict, you would have, I was reading something the other day, my colleague was telling me that support for Bush uh, before the, uh, the Iraq war was like 85%. You know? <laughs> so actually having 55% mid-war is not necessarily a very high support for Hamas. On the contrary, I, I would say. One thing to point out and I'll stop is also that when these wars, usually support for political parties goes up, but then goes down. And this has happened every single time. So I wouldn't take this as, you know, a lot of people, and to, to be honest, a lot of good pollsters, good people who've done a lot of good work have unfortunately chosen to ask people, do you support what Hamas did or whatever, which is an out of context kind of question, just to get a headline that says 80, 75% people support Hamas, you know, which is completely not how it is. Not that people don't support Hamas or that people, that there aren't people who are Hamas. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that the, the, the story is more nuanced and complicated and people want liberation. They don't want to just attack people. Um, I think it's just like this was a was unfortunately a, a, um, a lazy <laughs> approach to understanding the population. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Zain. So I want to go back on, on a few points. You said that in your polling, you found that in a way, October 7th gave people a kind of hope, right? That for the first time, you know, we are also attacking our oppressor and it's obviously a historical attack. You know, yeah. you know we've never seen this before. How does this, how does, uh, this translate in terms of what does it mean? Does it mean they would support armed resistance now? Or uh, as the polls show that it doesn't change much? And also, I guess the age is a big factor, right? So can you tell us, so October 7th apparently gave people some kind of a sense of hope, but what does it mean in practice? Would they support now armed resistance? No, absolutely not. I, I, the crazy part is support for armed resistance actually dropped. So when we ask people, what's the best thing to do now? Half as many people said clashes, even peaceful, right? <laughs> with, with, the, with the occupation, than they did like December, 2022. <laughs> when there was no October 7. What does that mean? Is that people want political change. And, you know, three lines under the word political. Something like this gives them hope only in so far as it actually translates to political gains. They don't just like attacking for the sake of it. They don't support armed resistance or they don't support violence for the sake of it, you know? And this is something that Israeli propaganda is trying to push that like, you know, children of light and children of darkness, you know, these guys, if they loved us as much as they, if they loved their children, they wouldn't do this to us. You know, this whole framing, really a fascistic kind of framing uh, that allows them to genocide us is absolutely there in their mind. Actually, in reality, people look at these things as potential opportunities for Israel to budge and to give some political change. So it actually decreases support for armed resistance. It increases support for political solutions, such as the two state, one state, whatever it is. You know, but mainly the two state, obviously, because that's the one on the table today. In terms of the political solution and who is, is going to lead this solution, so you're saying that when you're polling people about who is the person that you can see as a, as a potential leader, Marwan Barghouti is still number one, and he's been number one, as far as I know, for years. Um, and, and then you have uh, Sinwar. Um, but what you're saying is that the Palestine, the Palestinian Authority people are just pretty much inexistent when people think of leaders and stuff. So again, but does this mean that Palestinians that you've polled uh, want to uh, disband the PA, want to dissolve the PA or the PLO, or does it mean something else? Yeah, it definitely means something else. Like, because there's, we have conflicting information coming, right? While the support of people in the PA is actually very, very low, 
it's so low. Like it's I don't I've never looked up a politician with this low numbers as some of the people there. Honestly, like they should really think about this. However, when you ask people, do you want to dissolve the PA actually slash the PLO? Because there's there's two different formulations of this argument. Right, so some people focus their entire, you know, Palestinian um, national movement in the PA itself, which is actually kind of more of an administration <laughs> entity. And some people talking about the PLO. And in previous polling, the reason why we put PA PLO because in previous polling, actually, the line between these two things, while it is clear for some people who are intellectually thinking about this, is actually not clear for your. General population. For general population, PA, PLO, all of this is just one thing, you know, they're talking about it interchangeably. So support for disbanding it is lower, is low, it's not high. Actually, most people would want to keep it. I think what they mean is that they want new leadership and they tell you how they want it. They want it through elections. They, they say that, you know. So it's very clear. It's like, do we want the PLO? which is our internationally recognized representative of all Palestinians here, elsewhere, etc. Yes. Do we want it with its existing leadership? No. It's, you know, <laughs> that, that's pretty much what it is. The people want to reform the PLO slash PA, and they want new people in it, people that they think represent them more. And when I say represent them, I mean who posit clear path to change and liberation that now is absent. Do you have any sort of numbers on um, negotiations? Would, would the Palestinian be open for the PA, maybe with new leadership, to sit down at a table with, with Israel again? Or is that something you haven't really looked into so far? We haven't really looked into it, but I, I would say it's pre-assumed that people who propose a two-state solution that they understand is that it will come through negotiations. Actually, one way to make sure that this is the case, we ask people the question is slightly different. So on the one and two-state solutions, we ask that, so we ask them first to rate how appropriate that solution is, okay? And then we ask them that whether you think it's appropriate or not, if there was serious negotiations, would you accept it? And then more than 60% of people said they would accept a two state if negotiated. So they realize it's negotiated. So I think that, it, listen, like you have to come down, like I think I lived abroad as well. And, and now I live in Palestine. But when I lived abroad, I didn't quite understand the mentality sometimes of people here. The people here actually, they interact with Jewish Israelis every single day. You know, they go to the checkpoint, they go blah, blah. to sit down and talk about your rights. People will do it any given day, even after the biggest problem you know they face. They will do it because they have to, you know. Um, so I don't think that's a really a big issue here. On the contrary, I think what what we're seeing is that after attacking Israel, people are more willing to sit with them because now they feel ah, okay, now we can sit on the same table, you know. That that that's more the spirit than the more on the Israeli side. I would imagine the rejection the spirit of. You know, these guys, you know, they hate the children. They're the children of darkness. We don't, we're not racist. They are. So we're not saying that. We say, we sit with anyone if we get our rights. Uh, whereas, you know, Israeli position is obviously the opposite, opposite of that. And uh, I mean, in terms of a, a two state solution, because what's proposed now, what's been on the table for, for years since Oslo actually is, is a, it's not even a two state solution, right? It's like a kind of South African model of Bantu stands, you know, and then whatever, a tunnel under the earth that, that would lead to Gaza and stuff. So when, I mean, I don't know if you know that, but when they say a two-state solution, um, I, I'm not Palestinian, but my assumption would be what Israel has been doing to Palestinians, including in the West Bank and in Gaza for so many years, and even more so in the last th three months, is so horrible that potentially Palestinians do not want to see you know, want to live in the state without seeing Israeli Jews again, because for them also Israeli Jews, as you said, it mentioned, it means soldiers. I mean, the, most of the interaction they have with Israeli Jews are, are soldiers. So um, when they say two-state solution, do you know what, what kind of a two-state solution they'd, li they'd like? So we, we kept it pretty broad, to be honest, we, definitely worth further investigation, absolutely. But we've kept it intentionally broad because I think 
what people, what Palest most Palestinians we found in previous survey, what most Palestinians mean by that is 967 borders with no settlements. Okay. Obviously, some swaps here and there to just make it work, whatever. I think that's been negotiated and people know about it. But in general, people want 967, you know, free country, able to trade, connection between West Bank and Gaza, all the things that have been traditionally asked for by Palestinians. And you're absolutely right that when people get into a massacre, uh, you know, they don't want to live with the people who killed them. You know, if, if someone just conducted genocide on me, I don't want to live with them. So I think actually that's a big portion why reason why actually support for a two state solution also gets uh, increases is that people, they, they don't see a world whereby they can live, even in focus groups, when we tell people one state solution, they don't think equal rights, South African anti-apartheid movement. They think the first question they ask you is, is my neighbor going to be Israeli Jewish? Because I don't want that, actually. Um, you know, <laughs> they just, you know, they were just at the at the border uh, with the with the weapon uh, <laughs> controlling my movement. So I don't want them to be my neighbor. Um, so I think that's a big driver of it. You're absolutely right. And I think another potential driver is fear. So a lot of people just want to. So so now, like, one are more anxious for a solution because they they just saw a lot of death, you know, they don't want, you know, to further that. So they're willing to make a historical compromise just to stop that. So I, I think that's definitely a part of it for sure. Mm. And, and in terms of like, so let's say there's a two-stage solution, in, term of, in terms of the state they want, like, for example, we know that, you know, we cannot forget that Hamas also has got support in the West Bank. I think they actually won the, legis the last like legislative elections, like was it 2006, yeah. six, seven? Um, so. you, you told me when we spoke like last week or like 10 days ago that now 99% of the, the population in Palestine is, is Muslim. Actually, I mean, when they, we ask them, they will say like, we, we're Muslims. Does it mean they would like a state because I mean, we know the mainstream, the corporate media will say, all the Israelis will say, how can we live next to a state that will be ruled by Hamas and Sharia, Sharia law and stuff like that? So what, do, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, absolutely. So we ask people that, exactly. So we ask them, do you want secular? Okay, so in Arabic, the word secular has a dark history. Because, you know, all, all the secular dictatorships that, you know, obviously ruined everything for the Arab world and people blame them for that. And that's one thing. The other thing is like secular has become interchangeable with Western because that was the Western version of what you would call the separation of church and state. Now, church is different than mosque and Islam is different than Christianity and Arab secularism is different than Western secularism. So actually here, when you say that, you would say a civic state. So when we, they say, what a civic state means, or dawla madaniya in, in, in Arabic, that means it's the affairs of that state, the laws, the bylaws, the rules, everything, is actually governed by a civic arrangement rather than a religious or sharia arrangement. So that's, that's what we asked about, because that's the relevant. If you say the word secular, you will have 30% of society or whatever percent of society completely oppose this just because they hate Western things not because they're not secular. So we asked it that way, and we also gave people examples. We gave them examples of other Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries that are secular. <laughs> like for example, Turkey. I mean, you can have that debate, right? Is Turkey a secular state, blah, blah, But definitely it's not Iran or it's not even Saudi Arabia, right? So we, put, we told them, do you wanna be like Saudi Arabia, Iran? Or do you wanna be like Turkey, Indonesia, whatever? And they supported the secular by majority, by major amount of people, like over 70%. They want to live in a civic state, <laughs> aka secular state, where the laws are generated by, you know, mostly have accountability, democratic accountability, you know, yet like you would see any secular state elsewhere. And that's what people want. This idea about Sharia and all of that sphere is obviously okay, there are Islamic or Islamist parties like Hamas, <coughs> but support for that solution is actually like 
probably if you ask the same question in Israel, you'll have much higher amount of people who want Israel to be a theocracy, which, you know, you could argue it really is already, but a lot of more people will support that solution in Israel, actually. So, um, so I think that's, you know, important to put in perspective. And one point it's important to say is that support for Hamas is not synonymous to support for Saudi-like Sharia model, because Hamas is actually a democratic party. In previous polling, you know, we found that people who support who are more like pray more, who are more compliant with the Islamic code, are slightly more pro-democracy than, than others. Doesn't have to mean anything, but if at least it has to mean that people who, people being religious or being you know observant doesn't make them anti-democrat, pro-theocracy people. And people who support Hamas doesn't make them people who support Saudi like Mono. These are things and associations that are created, straw men, that are created in the mind of a racist uh, and a racist propaganda machine. That, you know, he keeps creating this, but in reality, it has nothing to, you know, the support for the reform of the PLO, the support for Mawan Barghouti, the support for secular state, all indications that people are still on the same line that they started with, which is they want a normal, secular independence where they can exercise their rights and freedoms like everybody else around the world. Hey, thanks, Zain. I think I think it's a very good way to end. Obviously, if you have you know a couple of things to add, feel free to do so. But I think it's, I think I mean I haven't had time to look you know thoroughly in, in your research because it's it's very thorough. But I'll put the links down, and I think it's it's such an incredible resource for for anyone, for journalists, for. For historians, for you know, um, people working uh, in sociology, what, what, you know, it's it's very uh, it's very important. So um, again, like if, yeah, if I may, add, so aside from these street pulses, so there's uh, on the website, which you know you will see now, there's a, a link to a dashboard, which basically we've created a huge amount of data from December 2022, so like a year ago almost. So not very odd days, still very relevant. It was in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do 48 at that time. But it asked all sorts of questions, like about people's social interests, religiosity, political solutions, support for political parties. And it's an interactive dashboard, so you can go in and you can basically um, you know, play with the lever. So if you want to see how it is in Hebron, specifically, you can go. If you see how women think differently than yeah. men, you can see that. So we'll keep improving this. This is still the beta version. We'll keep improving this. Um, mind you, a lot of this work, not a lot of it, every single part of it is done, you know, not with, you know, by volunteers, effectively, yeah. who volunteer their time. So, you know, we'll do better, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> but it's already great for people, as you said, who want to, to get, like, data points from the past. It's a huge representative sample. People can play around with it and, and see what they... Um, what they can use it for. Amazing. Hey, shukranik tier Zain. And um, and yeah, thanks again for your work, and we'll we'll speak soon. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.